retreat and a presentation on the proposed regulatory cooperation chapter in a TPIP and on procurement. Thank you. Um, and um, yes, I am Sharon Tree, a president of the Commonwealth. Very glad to be here after this a couple of uh, meetings, mostly due to health issues. And I'm really pleased to be here to um, talk about a couple of things not relating to the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, so much, but to the Trans-Atlantic Partnership, which is the one with the European Union. I thought I'd first talk about the procurement issues because that's a little shorter and less complicated. Um, one of the things about the European Union Agreement that is really quite different from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and from previous uh, trade, trade agreements that the United States has entered into is that the European Union is quite determined to um, include uh, U.S. state governments, counties, and cities as part of the procurement um, commitments, which is to say that um, U.S. state uh, governments um, that generally set their own uh, criteria for what things uh, the state might buy with tax dollars uh, and their own standards would have to open everything up to European uh, Union um, companies really pretty much without restriction. Um, in the past, the U.S. government has not um, included states, counties, municipalities unless those um, entities um, specifically agreed to be included. And generally, um, the interest <coughs> in being part of these agreements has actually been dwindling over the last um, several agreements. But in general, when um, states have agreed to it, they often limit what they agree to. So they might say, well, we agree to doing, um, <coughs> to including things that we purchase relating to construction, but we don't uh, agree to anything to do with transportation, uh, things like that. Um, in part, uh, it's an interest in um, promoting buying local, buy American, um, and in fact, economic development. Uh, and so uh, one thing that is quite different with the European Union Agreement is that really one of their top demands, the things that the European Union wants more than almost anything else in this agreement is to bind um, states, counties, and municipalities. And they've come out with some proposals that, unlike the U.S. side, we can't see any of those generally. Most people can't. Um, the European Union has actually posted a lot of its proposals or um, sort of policy papers that say what they're looking for. And in this case, they've been pretty clear they want to include um, not only, um, well, they definitely want to include a lot of large cities and, and um, states to start off with, but they're also talking about public hospital purchasing, um, university systems like the University of Maine system um, would be bombed by that. Uh, and, um, and they're very uh, insistent that some of the things that they want to get rid of are things that we have right now, which are, say, small business set-asides that actually have preferential treatment for small businesses. It's kind of an irony because one of the main talking points in favor of the transatlantic agreement is that it's supposed to uh, be helpful to small and medium sizes enterprises. They call them SMEs. And uh, in the case of um, you know, small business set-asides, that actually is something that really helps small businesses, but the European Union is interested in getting rid of that. So this has been a big issue, um, and there hasn't been really much discussion about it between the European Union negotiators and the U.S. negotiators, but there were actually articles today in the trade press saying that the um, Celia Malmström, who's the head um, trade minister for the um, European Union was in Washington um, yesterday, met with um, her counterpart, Mike Perlman, from the U.S. trade representatives. And so they came out with a somewhat vague agreement saying that they were going to be really looking into the procurement uh, issues and the U.S. was going to be coming forward with some kind of an offer uh, sometime in January. So. This is a live issue, and um, it would really change the way we do things here in the state of Maine. And uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on that issue. Um, one of the things that 
we have done here in the state is that we passed legislation saying that the legislature would be involved in making any decision about whether or not the state of Maine agrees to be bound by international treaties um, provisions around procurement. And uh, in the past, there hasn't been a very um, smooth system for the U.S. government to be um, communicating with uh, legislatures, let's say. Uh, so I don't know how that would work. And there is a danger that the U.S. Uh, government could essentially agree to it without asking for the states, counties, municipalities to agree to be bound, but simply do it, uh, you know, because that's the only way they're going to get an agreement. So it's a big issue, and it's something that this commission might want to, um, you know, involve itself in later in terms of, um, I mean, this, this topic is a big one, and, and it's definitely going to be huge in terms of um, evaluating the European Union agreement. So it might be one of those topics that is worth scheduling a whole meeting around and actually getting people to present on the different aspects of it for a future meeting. Um, you know, so that's, it might, that's something to think about. You know, in contrast, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is not really focused on that. And from what everything I know, um, state-level procurement is, is not included unless states choose to do it. It's a voluntary thing. And one of the reasons is that uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there's other countries like Malaysia, for example, that um, have a lot of programs that um, protect economic development opportunities for indigenous populations and things like that. And these are operated through their sub-central, you know, kind of equivalent of US state levels. And so they're very, they're not interested in, in seeing that happen. And the European Union, in contrast, where they already do this within the European Union, so they're not actually, from their point of view, the US already has access so main businesses already have access right now to a lot of European Union purchasing um, subcentrally if they're going to do it. So they're trying to get the same level. You know, they're trying to get the U.S. to basically do the same thing that they are doing in the European Union. You know, so it's a it's a whole different political situation, but it could turn out to be one of those issues that, um, regardless of what people have done in the past or what states think. If the U.S. negotiators want to get an agreement, it may be that they have to agree to procurement, uh, making it binding on states, uh, even if none of the states agree to it. That could be the political choice that, they're, that they would be put in, uh, because it is so important to the European Union. So, okay, so um, regulatory cooperation. The reason I, I'm sort of focusing on these two different issues with the uh, um, transatlantic agreement is that they're really different in kind from what um, the U.S. has agreed to in the past, like in the case of procurement, and also this regulatory cooperation stuff. Um, regulatory cooperation is a proposal coming from the European Union um, negotiators. And there is a lot posted on their website about it. Um, I just wrote a report for the um, Center for International Environmental Law, um, which came out on Tuesday. <laughs> and um, it's really long, and they, they seem to use extremely small typeface. Uh, it looks sharp, but uh, you may need glasses to read it and uh, a willingness to delve into um, a lot of detail that maybe um, you won't find as interesting as I did. Uh, but what I did was really parse the proposals that have come from the European Union on this subject and really try to understand um, how it would work. And what is, first of all, regulatory cooperation from the European point of view is really different from what the United States has been trying to get in different agreements. Um, both what the United States and the European Union are interested in is um, focusing on how rules and regulations are um, enacted uh, in their countries. The, um, it's not really about things like tariffs and trade so much as uh, limiting regulations or making regulations similar between the European Union and the United States. In the past, the, um, 
the U.S. has focused on what they call regulatory coherence. Um, what they have really focused on is what we do already in the state of Maine. We have something called the Administrative Procedures Act. I think any legislators here are probably pretty in, aware of how the Administrative Procedures Act works. And you know the whole notice and comment uh, system when a law is passed and then you know an agency implements that law through various regulations. They have to go out to public hearing or not, but at least there's an opportunity for the public to read the rule, comment on it. The agency goes back, decides what they want to do. They have to explain if they deviate a lot from what they did with the earlier proposed rule and so on. Um, this is a system we're all very familiar with. Um, and it's something that the United States is interested in seeing the European Union do. I'm not going to get into how the European Union makes their laws and regulations, but it's very complicated. It's very different from how we do it. It's just a completely different system. You've got, um, you, you know, I think it's 32, I'm not sure, countries now in the European Union, but they're countries, they're not states. They have their own national governments, their own national parliaments but they also have this overarching uh, government. And so it's just a really different system. The US is interested in seeing a lot of the things that we do in this country uh, done by the European Union when they adopt you know, automobile regulations, banking regulations, environmental regulations, whatever. Uh, on the European side, but that said, the US, because they never release any of their proposals for any of these trade agreements, we can't actually say what they want. <laughs> we can only say what they've wanted in other, dis other treaties, okay? So we don't really know for sure, but that's the approach the US has taken. The European Union is looking for something that's really quite different. Um, they want to have an ongoing thing called a regulatory cooperation body that will be made up of trade officials from the European Union and the US as well as agency uh, people, like, I don't know who exactly, I haven't gone into a lot of specifics from different um, policy agencies, potentially. This will be an ongoing body whose job it will be to try to sort of supervise, encourage, mandate, uh, make happen uh, harmonization of regulations between the European Union and the US. That is to say, uh, trying to get the regulations to be either equivalent either the same or to say, well, this regulation is, is a, quick, you know, a mutual recognition where you say, well, this regu these regulations are different, but essentially they do the same thing. So if you comply with the one in the European Union, then you've been deemed to comply with the one over here in the US or vice versa. Um, so they, they want to set up this body. There's a number of things that this body would do. And one of the things that's quite different from any previous proposal that anybody I know has ever seen coming out of a trade agreement is that it would reach very directly into the procedures that go on in US states. And not only regu regulatory agencies, but legislatures, including Congress. Um, there's a bunch of things that they're asking for. Uh, one of the uh, things that they want is to have advance notice of new laws before they're proposed. So the idea would be that, you know, ahead of time, you know, they, they could ask and get a big list of all the, the bills that are going to be uh, pending in the main legislature. That, okay. Now, legislators know that we have certain confidentiality rules that govern, uh, you know, when things are public, and uh, we can often, you know, keep working on bills for a while before they become public information. Um, that is something that is potentially, a, in my reading of this uh, proposal, uh, threatened. And this would apply to governors. Now we all know that even, you know, our especially our current governor has sometimes surprised even his own party with some of his proposals. Uh, over the years, you know, I was in the legislature for a long time, and there's been tension with pretty much every governor that I ever served with, putting in a package of bills at the last minute <laughs> when the legislature's almost done, and saying, okay, now you have to deal with this stuff. 
and the legislature, you know, saying, well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Uh, but that's the prerogative that the governor has. And under these proposals, it, and it's a little unclear because there's a lot of, uh, they call it brackets, where they're saying, well, and footnotes and things, and we're not totally sure how this would apply to those sub-central areas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, there is an interest in getting information about all of these uh, significant and important bills in advance. Um, before the, the se legislative session even starts. And that would be really upending the way we do things and from a constitutional point of view, uh, it's really a prerogative in my view and I think cons you know, the, probably the state Supreme Court might say the same thing because they've had cases involving these sorts of things, what is uh, up to the legislature and what's up to others. Uh, so that's one of the proposals. One of the other aspects of it is that certain uh, pieces of legislation or regulation um, chosen by uh, European Union officials would be kind of uh, designated as things that they would like to see additional studies done on. So they could say, okay, uh, you know, Representative Hickman has this bill about, I don't know, food, right? Agriculture, whatever. Uh, and they say, you know, we think this has an effect on trade or on uh, investment. Uh, one of the things about this proposal, it's really broadly written, it could cover pretty much any law or regulation on any topic, even if it really doesn't apply to trade at all. That's the plain language of, of the text that they proposed. Uh, but they would say, okay, we're interested in this bill from Representative Hickman, we wanna have some um, impact studies done on it. Uh, because we think that, you know, we want to find out whether this is, uh, you know, a, a potentially a law or regulation that is, uh, could be done in a different way. That doesn't put uh, as much impact on trade or as much cost on business. And we're going to do that through this international regulatory cooperation body. Uh, and they would come out with a report. Now, part of this also would be something they called a regulatory exchange where they would say, well, we like you know, we want to do something with this proposal of Representative Hickman's. We think it should be harmonized so that it's more similar to what we do in the European Union. So we're going to ask them to participate uh, in a regulatory exchange. Uh, the proposal says this isn't mandatory, but if I suspect Representative Hickman would want to be at the table if people are sitting down and analyzing his uh, legislation to see whether or not parts of it should be changed uh, to match up with what the European Union is already doing. Uh, so, you know, there's those aspects of it. The other part of it is it says, well, you know, you don't need to worry about this. The European Union isn't going to be calling Representative Hickman on the phone. Instead, the U.S. will designate kind of a key agency, and it'll be the agency's responsibility to reach out to state governments all over the United States, gather information about all of these bills that are being proposed, and to somehow get state governments to participate in these regulatory exchanges. Uh, it's all very unclear about how it would be enforced, what's voluntary and what isn't, but it, it's, the whole proposal is very much designed to uh, get involved in legislation and regulations before they happen, you know, before they're actually enacted by the legislature or adopted by a regulatory agency. Um, there's a lot more to it, but it, it, there's a, a lot of concerns about it that I think, and, you know, the paper that I wrote focuses on environmental and um, sort of toxic issues. However, I would say you could apply the same analysis to regulations involving anything really um, whether it's you know insurance rules that we have you know whether it has to do with um, you know really anything any subject matter that uh, the legislature or an executive agency gets involved in public utility rules you know any of these things um, it, it's as it's written it's very um, potentially intrusive into um, what how you know the procedures that are function and if, in fact, you know, the legislature or legislators or you know, members of the governor's staff or different agency heads are interested in making sure that you know, our 
policies are not um, somehow affected, um, I think that there comes with it a pretty significant um, financial and sort of bureaucratic cost to, to being part of this whole thing. The ultimate goal is that, and there's other provisions that are proposed in the, the TTIP or the Transatlantic Agreement. This is just one of them, um, but there's a lot of other chapters that are proposed that are very much designed to say, uh, you can't have regulations that are overly burdensome on trade, and if, if you do, uh, they are subject to challenge uh, in the, the investor state dispute <coughs> settlement um, system, which is a, a arbitration system that um, investors or, or companies, foreign companies can use to um, challenge rules and regulations and laws. Uh, one of the concerns about this whole regulatory cooperation um, proposal is that it's essentially designed to, to develop the, the data that then could be used um, to challenge uh, our laws and regulations later on. And it would actually be developed by the governments themselves, so I think it would carry a lot of weight. Uh, it wouldn't just be somebody speculating about something, it would be this, this impact statement that, that was done. Um, you know, it's hard to know, I, I, I don't know that this is going anywhere or not. Uh, it is not particularly, um, it's, it's raised a lot of concerns for a lot of uh, people in the European Union as well as in the U.S. because it also applies to the European Union's um, uh, member countries and those parliaments and, and, and uh, that, that, that I discussed um, earlier. So uh, it's unclear you know, how it would apply um, exactly to them as well as to, the, to U.S. states. But one of my concerns, you know, I read the language really carefully, and there's all this language that says, you know, nothing here is, supposed, is intended to get in the way of, of the rights that um, the parties have to regulate in the public interest, to protect the public. Um, that's our role, that's what we do. We have constitutional authority to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, this language only protects the parties, the parties being the European Union and the United States. There's nothing in there that says that uh, governments below the federal government level have uh, any right to legislate or regulate at all. And the other thing that really concerned me was that there's, they, there's language that exempts out for the European Union countries uh, laws and regulations that they do that are basically implementing their federal laws. And as we all know, you know, there are many, many of the federal laws in the United States are implemented or sort of co-enforced by the state governments. I mean, you know, and I, I'm particularly familiar with environmental you know, laws, but we've got the Clean Air Act and then you know, the state of Maine comes up with its implementation plan and it comes up with various laws and regulations to implement that federal law, and those are done to further the federal law. The language that I read said those types of things, if it were done by the European Union countries, are protected and they're excluded from this whole regulatory cooperation proposal. But n there's nothing in there that says that similar kinds of laws and regulations enacted by U.S. states are protected. So there's a lot in it. Um, you know, the United States may not be supportive of it. I mean, I, it also would apply to Congress, which I have a rather difficult time imagining Congress um, wanting to be sharing advanced copies of legislation with the European Union before they, you know, released it to the public <laughs> or anybody else. Uh, and other things in here. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that the, the federal government is going to be supportive of what's here. But one of the difficulties we have is that they do not, um, you know, uh, tell you publicly really what they think about anything. And they don't have any counter proposals that are public information. And the fact is that whatever goes on behind closed doors. Uh, is unknown, and so we don't know what kinds of um, discussions are had in, at the negotiating table around this. So that's kind of a summary of this, and uh, you know, the paper 
goes into a lot of detail um, about you know sort of the environmental side of it. But I guess I would just stress that uh, the scope of these uh, proposals would actually cover virtually any state law and regulation on any subject, whether or not it affects trade. And that, to me, was a, a big concern. Can I ask 